Hello and welcome to the Japan Zumina at UC San Diego. I'm Ulrika Shade. I'm the director of the Japan Forum for Innovation and Technology, which is our Japan Center here at GPS, the School of Global Policy and Strategy. GPS is an international relations and public policy school. We have a focus on the Pacific Rim and we offer a master's in international affairs with, Jap with a J Japan specialization or other Asian specializations. If you're interested in our programmatic offerings, please go to gps.ucsd.edu. And at GPS, we have JFIT, our Japan center. More information on JFIT is on jfit.ucsd.edu. JFIT has a uh, bi-weekly newsletter and a lot of activities. If you're interested in what we do, please go to jfit.ucsd.edu and there is this tab called News and Media where you can sign up for our uh, news flash. And it's right next, by the way, to the tab called Japan Zuminars where you can uh, see our previous recordings and upcoming events. And yes, our recording is, uh, our show is uh, recorded. And so uh, I will uh, uh, today and always uh, not call you by your last name to protect your privacy other than of course our speakers. By the way, uh, I have my own website as well, thejapanologist.com. And while I have your attention, let me point out that the Zuminar is a weekly event. And of course, today we're going to talk about energy and 10 years after Fukushima. Next week, we're going to talk about entrepreneurship and whether it can be taught and whether governments can create entrepreneurial initiatives. Uh, I'll have Professor Kenji Kutsuna from Kobe University with me, as well as Robert Eberhard from Stanford. Uh, following that will be um, a, a discussion with Patricia McLachlan from UT Austin on Japan's policies for the common man and why Japan seems to look fairly stable right now, whether this has anything to do with policy measures. Uh, please note that we'll also have an upcoming uh, Ezra Vogel Memorial to discuss the role of Japan as number one and its impact on US-Japan research, as well as a, a show on the Japanese marketing. Okay, enough of the forecast. Let me uh, stop my PowerPoint and introduce my guests today. Uh, professors Aldrich and uh, uh, not Professor Tom O'Sullivan, uh, an energy expert. So welcome, gentlemen. Let me introduce you one and then the other before we uh, start our conversation. So Professor Daniel Aldrich is a full professor of political science, public policy, and urban affairs. That's a mouthful, Daniel. Uh, he's also the director of the Security and Resilience Studies Program at Northeastern University. He has previously taught or been a, uh, a research fellow at Purdue, Tulane, the University of Tokyo, and uh, Harvard, as well as the USAID. He holds an, a BA and MA in Asian Studies from UNC and UC Berkeley, as well as an MA and PhD in government from Harvard University. He's written four books uh, and by my account, 40 plus refereed articles and a lot of op-ed pieces, so one of which was, uh, is a recent one we'll talk about today. He has published in journals ranging from natural hazards to the American behavioral scientists. So I'm very interested, Daniel, to hear more about your research. And of course, your recent book, uh, The Black Wave, was on the Fukushima uh, event and uh, how communities shape outcomes. And our second guest today is Tom O'Sullivan. He originally hails from Ireland. He's a true Irish. Not, not one of those American Irish, no, no, a real one. Uh, he got his degree in, uh, in civil engineering and a CPA from the University of Cork. He is, uh, he then, uh, I don't know how, ended up in Japan. He was with uh, Gardmoor and uh, 12 years at Merrill Lynch. Uh, he's also, uh, first I believe uh, maybe the route was that you started with PwC in Dublin and then somehow segged into investment banking, I gather. Uh, he was also spent some time at Deutsche Bank, that was much shorter than Merrill, and probably a good thing. Uh, so 20 years plus is investment banking. You are now, Tom, a uh, Northeast Asia markets, defense, econ, and energy consultant. You're working with, uh, or actually that's your, your company is Matthias Global Energy Solutions, and you are also a member of the editorial board of Japan NRG, which writes a fabulous newsletter uh, that has everything that's in the news and is currently going on in Japan energy. And I think you'll talk a little bit about what's currently going on uh, uh, soon. So let's begin. Uh, let me suggest, uh, Daniel, uh, that we start with you. 
since you're you've written a lot about Fukushima and you followed uh, a lot of the angles of Fukushima, uh, ten years after Fukushima, what have we learned? We we know that coal is cheap, green is expensive, nuclear is unpopular, and so this puts policymakers in a tough spot. And so, well, you know, we had uh, Toyota san from the Enneken uh, here a while ago, and he was kind of talking about, you know, security is critical and stability. So can you walk us through that? And here I see your PowerPoint. So, uh, so, so Professor Aldrich, uh, the, the microphone is yours. Thank you very much, Ulrike, and thank you, Tom, for this conversation. And before I start, just thank you both. Thank you all for being here as well in the audience. I put out my email address and my Twitter handle in case you've got questions we don't have time for tonight. I'm very happy to engage you on those other platforms uh, as well as this conversation tonight. Um, so I guess, you know, Ulrike has asked about the, the history over the last decade since uh, 311, since the 311 disasters in Japan, the huge earthquake, the 9.0 earthquake, the 20 meter tsunami, and then the, the meltdowns at three reactors. And I would say for me, there's really three larger lessons that are worth talking about at least now as we approach that 10 year anniversary. Uh, the first is that surprisingly enough, despite a lot of, I think, hope honestly, from a lot of anti-nuclear activists in Japan, uh, certainly if you read, for example, stuff from Wise Paris, if you read stuff from uh, people like uh, Izuka uh, Taki, which are the people who've, who've argued that Fukushima should be a turning point, Japan as a government at least, is very much wedded to nuclear power, even a decade after Fukushima. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, next, I would say, despite that broader connection that's ongoing, I think there are two different things that have changed the energy policy field. Uh, one was the disaster itself. And I'll give some evidence, I think, from research uh, that my students and I have been doing on the way that disasters changed community approaches, at least to energy, but also broader structural changes. I'm sure everyone here knows already on this call about things like the feed-in tariff, for example, uh, along with uh, you know changes like the new regulator, the NRA there in Japan, not the gun supporting NRA from North America, uh, but rather the uh, the nuclear regulator in Japan. And the third and final point I'll, I'll try to talk about in my short time uh, is that I think. Uh, again, despite recent promises, and Ulrike mentioned this op-ed that I wrote with Philip Lipsy of Toronto, um, I, I think there's going to be two major reasons that we don't see 100% uh, renewable energy or at least a real break uh, from nuclear and fossil to the degree that we might want to see, let's say, uh, given the incredible urgency of climate change. And that's, I think, because of technical reasons, but also broader opposition from civil society. So just really quickly, uh, i just go through a few broader things. I, I found some really great imagery here to illustrate some of these arguments. So of course, everyone who's interested in nuclear power knows that for, for quite some time, nuclear power was incredibly popular in Japan. Uh, surveys of the broader population regularly showed two thirds or more of the population supported nuclear power and its expansion. Uh, and those surveys went up literally until February of 2011. That is right until the disaster, most people that you would talk to in Japan thought the nuclear industry was the bee's knees. Uh, and of course, we can talk more about it in a few minutes, the ways they, they got local support for that. Um, what of course happened after the disaster, the meltdowns at Fukushima, there was a big loss of trust between the average Japanese person, especially living in these communities along the coast that host these plants and the central government. We could, we could talk also about SafeCast and the other NGOs that have sprung up to try and provide radiation information. But what you see, of course, is that dropped uh, from roughly at some points 54 reactors in the fleet that were capable of sustaining energy, around 300 gigawatts or so, um, down to around 10. And, we, and, and that's not, um, it's roughly nine or 10 nuclear power plants now out of that fleet of 54 are still operational. And, and that is, of course, going to make it very challenging to provide uh, broader carbon dioxide free uh, energy uh, because we have now lost that. And again, this is just a map of those kind of things. You'll see here, uh, if you look on the east coast of Japan, even though the Fukushima Daini plants were untouched by the disaster, by the 311 disasters, those plants are offline. Fukushima, the governor, local mayors have all said they do not have an interest in restarting nuclear power. Uh, those, those plants are out completely. And we'll talk about in a few minutes, a number of local governors, mayors, and even local courts, which in the past had been sympathetic to nuclear power, uh, have more recently, over the last five or six years, uh, actually ruled against or refused to allow the restart of some nuclear power plants. So right now, and this is a little bit old, this image a little bit old, but roughly it's about the same, nine or 10 active plants right now as we enter 2021. Okay, so we have a broad government interest still, and this is where I say we have what my friends call the fantasy documents, 
of the nuclear power industry, uh, which is this long-standing belief from Japanese government officials that somehow they will be the only nation in the world with the technical expertise to have what's called a closed fuel cycle. What is a closed fuel cycle? Uh, in, in a very few words, to avoid all the nonsense, it is basically belief that rather than having to put at any stage nuclear spent fuel into a cask where they're dry or wet storage for long term, you will continue to use and re-enrich that, maybe as MOX fuel, for example, maybe in advanced ATR reactors. Uh, and the idea, of course, is that places like the Rokasho uh, uh, facilities, that's the little red dot on the right side of the map there, uh, would somehow come alive after now decades of, uh, of attempts and billions in dollars of funding, both to the community itself and to the technical side. Or for example, the Manju uh, reactor, which was again, a fast breeder reactor. It never worked despite, I would say roughly 4.7 billion US dollars pumped into that uh, tremendous hakamono waste of space and time over time. But this is still a belief in 2021 that many authorities that I've spoken to in the Japanese government believe will still be true. And as I, as I talk to you right now, for example, they are talking about storing short-term nuclear waste, uh, probably in Futaba, we can talk about that if you want to, and then starting Rokasho next year, it's always next year. So this is still the long-term plan despite Fukushima and despite broader opposition from the Japanese society to that kind of process. Now, I'm bringing in data now, uh, I forgot to mention this, uh, I'm bringing in data from uh, my colleague, Tim Frazier, and also I'll be talking about some ideas I've borrowed from colleagues like Paul Scalise, from Jacques Hyman, from Mark Ramsayer. Um, we were really curious, after that disaster, after the 311 disasters, would going through a shock make a difference in terms of who adopts renewable energy? And this image right now is just looking at solar, a very simple measure, which is in these communities, uh, how many new rooftop solar units are being adopted? And this is a little hard to read in this graph, I apologize for that, but basically what it shows is the following. Um, where we see more damage from the disaster, that is to say where the community went through more, they were closer to the tsunami, they had less uh, infrastructure protecting them, they had more deaths and so forth, those communities are investing more heavily in renewable energies. Other communities that could have invested in solar and, and wind are not doing so. So it's not that immediately after Fukushima, every, every local community in Japan jumped on the renewable energy bandwagon, despite the availability of feed-in tariffs. Rather, it's that certain communities did this and others didn't. And by the way, if you want, I can give you links to, to Tim's work that also looks at networks uh, of policymakers in these communities. Um, we've also looked, by the way, across countries. So for example, in North America as well, uh, going through a shock like Hurricane Sandy, where you recognize that the grid may not always be up and running. If there's a hurricane that cuts you off, how do you get electricity running? How do you get dialysis running? How do you get refrigeration running, right? So what we looked here was communities that had it didn't have damage in those communities. And again, you see here, uh, North America and Japan are relatively similar. Those communities that have been through the shock that have more of an effect from some kind of outside event, those are the ones that it seemed to adopt afterwards. So if you want to talk about Tom Berkland's work, the idea of these focal points right in, in a policy process, there's a major shock and people can change their kind of decision makings. Okay, here's the interesting thing. Uh, the feed-in tariff uh, was a political compromise. I would call it that. Maybe Tom can talk more about it if he's like to. Uh, it has overall increased uh, the number of, for example, uh, residential solar systems in Japan. Um, not in, in a massive number of ways though. Uh, that is to say, if you're thinking that, for example, every Japanese home uh, that's being built in Tokyo right now, every new uh, school is going to have solar, uh, that is not the case right now. Uh, and again, I think there's a variety of reasons why certain communities or certain households would or wouldn't adopt that. But again, uh, that is not a broader scale thing. And here we're just looking at megawatt adaptation. It's, it's a little hard to see, but basically what you see is since the 1990s actually, and I believe actually now we're looking at geothermal installations, um, it has basically been a straight line. Uh, that is to say, Fukushima did not massively change uh, the number of installations uh, or at least megawatt production from geothermal facilities. So some things seem to be a little bit stuck, uh, let's say overall. So I wanna give Tom time to talk and have a conversation, but here's what I would argue overall based on the research that, that I'm talking about. One is that even though uh, Japan uh, has a very strong anti-nuclear feeling right now, that is the average Japanese citizen is not pro-nuclear anymore, as they were before 2011, I think it's very unlikely we'll see the end of nuclear power anytime soon. Let's say, unlike Germany uh, and, and Energy Venda, right, where we had a moratorium on nuclear power plants, uh, a much higher tax, uh, much higher electricity rates coming up. Um, Japan, I think, is in 
politically bed with nuclear power in a very strong way. So we can talk about it also. Amakudadi from TEPCO, the, one of the major producers, uh, two bureaucrats and back and forth again, a strongly captured industry for sure for many years, even with the NRA in place. Um, and there are all kinds of reasons why that's the case. And I've just lift, lifted three here. Even if every nuclear power plant in Japan were to stop tomorrow, uh, the decommissioning process will take about 40 years per site, uh, which for example means even though Fukushima is not having any new plants and not making electricity, uh, between now and probably, let's say, for fun, 2050, nuclear power will be part of their industry. That is to see people coming into the areas will be there because of nuclear power, people visiting, tourists will be visiting because of nuclear power. And of course, decontamination there as well, but also foreign markets. Uh, Japan is still very much pushing its attempts to site nuclear power plants in other countries, even as its own uh, new sites themselves go down. So that's one, one broad area of discussion. The other idea here I'm, I want to talk about a little bit is this idea of democratization. And again, I mentioned that a number of citizens, especially those hit by disaster strongly, have taken on uh, solar rooftop powers and so forth. Um, that still, I would argue, needs stronger institutional support before we see any real major changes. Uh, the, the discontinuation of the feed-in tariff really hit that pretty hard. Uh, I, had, I had friends, for example, running NGOs, they would get $300 a month by installing solar at that time. They didn't care about the, the philosophy or the broader problems of nuclear or anything else. They just wanted to bring the money home. Um, that is no longer the case. And that is without that is a problem. I think finally, my, my final argument would be uh, sort of hearkening to Steve Vogel. Uh, as you know, the son of Ezra Vogel just passed away. Um, it's very naive to envision energy solely in terms of technology or solely in terms of a market, that somehow those two things, technology markets being divorced from politics. Every decision that I've been talking about since I started talking a few minutes ago is strongly connected to political ones. Uh, that is to say, for example, why Japan invested in nuclear power after World War II and not in solar and not in geothermal, for example. Uh, that, of course, the geothermal is because very strong pressure from the own and hotel operators who believe, probably truly, that the installation of geothermal would make it harder for them to have their clients enjoy their uh, hot springs uh, there when they're staying overnight there in uh, maybe Niigata, whatever else they're going to be. That's my favorite places myself. Um, so to try to divorce the technologies of geothermal, which of course has been around for a long time, Iceland's done a great job with that, um, from the reality of the politics on the ground of local activists, of local interests, I would be pretty naive. So um, I'll wrap up there and to say, if you're interested, as Uke kindly mentioned, I've got a few books on these topics, Black Waves, the most recent one, Site Fights, the Nuclear Power, and Building Resilience on how societies handle shocks. Thanks. Well, fantastic. Thank you, Daniel, for this uh, this introduction and uh, lots lots to follow up on. And, and I completely agree, of course, with the politics argument. Right? This is a, it's it's a the, these are trade offs. It's not as if there's an easy solution and people don't want to do it. It's it's a it's a complicated situation where trade offs have to be made. And whenever there is a, a chance to make a trade off, uh, there will be politics, right? So, so Tom, uh, you, it, what, what is it to, to understand what's going on in Japan right now and what these politics are and what, and, and some of the things that, that Daniel just mentioned, what, what are the, what, what does one really have to appreciate to understand what's happening in Japan? Right. Okay. Well, firstly, Ulrike, thank you very much for the invitation to, to speak today on Japan Zoominar. Uh, and thank you to Daniel as well for participating. Just kind of wanted initially just to follow up on, on some of the issues that Daniel was discussing. Firstly, of course, on nuclear, given that, uh, you know, we have a, um, the entire, um, you know, electricity sector in Japan is privatized. Uh, you know, all 10 of the utilities are listed on the Tokyo Stock Exchange. But unfortunately, only three of the reactors have restarted after, you know, or are currently um, operating in Japan, you know, 10 years after Fukushima. So that kind of is a major setback for the 10 utilities, um, I believe. And, you know, that's mainly probably attributable uh, to, to, of course, the NRA um, uh, as uh, not the National Rifle Association, as Daniel said, but the Nuclear Regulatory Authority, you know, imposing stricter rules. Um, we've got a lot of anti-terrorism efforts as well. Um, you know, which they uh, anti-terrorism uh, provisions, which they're insisting on at the various nuclear sites. My, my guesstimate is that that probably has cost the utilities 10 billion plus, at least in terms of reinforcing those uh, structures around uh, around the country. Um, so, so that would be my first comment. And of course, on the east side of Japan, where we had the earthquake, there have been no restarts. Um, all of the restarts have been on the west side of Japan. Uh, and yesterday or this week, we had a very interesting situation where Fukui Prefecture, also uh, the mayor of Takahama, I think, approved 
uh, for the first time in Japan, an extension beyond 40 year life of the nuclear power plants. You're obviously based in California, but I think you faced some of these issues, Ulrike, there, but that was the first approval. But unfortunately, it has to go through the prefectural government, or fortunately, whichever way you want to look at it, and the governor of, of Fukui will have to approve, will have to sign off on that. So it's very complicated politics, as, as, as Daniel said. I would also say that, you know, the costs, still the costs of cleaning up Fukushima would probably be somewhere between 500 billion to a trillion dollars, apparently. So again, that is a very, very expensive um, a tab for Japan to bear. Uh, just secondly, um, you know, one of the fallouts, I think, I, I'm, I'm you know, more involved in the electricity sector, but obviously Japan has deregulated its power sector over the last couple of years following the Fukushima accident. So that's being a positive outcome, I think. Some of us here uh, based in, in Tokyo are seeing cheaper electricity prices. Uh, we've probably seen a 50% attrition rate from the um, from the utilities to kind of independent players, which is good, which means that I, I now get a choice about where I want to buy my power. I don't have to just buy it from TEPCO. And actually I did migrate away from TEPCO to a smaller operator recently, you know, who's, who's selling called Menden, who's selling, um, you know, um, green energy. So, so, so that kind of um, um, uh, options, uh, those kind of options are available to the Japanese buying public here. Um, um, but of course, again, as Daniel says, this is a crucial year for Japan. We've got a general election later this year. Prime Minister Suga is new on the job, as we know. He's, he's, ta he's taken a very political stand on mobile phones. I think it will be quite sensitive issue for him to play around too much with electricity prices this year, given that, you know, he's got to, as I said, run an election before the end of October. And if anyone was watching the press conference last night where he announced the extension of the, um, the emergency period to March 7th, he was asked some questions about the recent uh, electricity outages or the, the, the capacity, you know, Kansai almost hit 100% capacity uh, um, earlier on or early in early January due to the very cold spell and due, due to shortages of LNG. So the prime minister was, was kind of asked about that. So, so it's on the political radar screen still here. Um, and of course, just uh, thirdly, I'd like to talk a little bit about maybe the European pressures. Obviously, Prime Minister Suga came out with this um, carbon neutrality by 2050, which kind of took a lot of us by surprise. I thought it was, you know, I thought it should have been done by Prime Minister Abe a long time ago, but it wasn't. But um, I, I assume that, you know, uh, he probably uh, saw the political tea leaves in the US and, the, and that Joe Biden would be elected president and decided that he had to move. Plus, we have the we have the Glasgow um, COP26 later this year, um, and I think Japan will be forced to to uh, disclose, uh, you know, what its exact plans are for carbon neutrality 2050, um, and again, maybe what its plans are for the electricity sector. You know, Prime Minister Suga hasn't made any announcements about the power sector, unlike Joe Biden. Joe Biden has said that America will be carbon neutral. Uh, that the that the um, American power sector will be carbon neutral by 2035. So that's a bit of a difference there. Um, but I think as far as Europe goes, obviously they're, the Japanese are paying a lot of attention uh, to the Europeans as well. They obviously, uh, Ursula von der Leyen has come out with a climate neutrality policy by 2050. They're putting a lot of um, you know, new policy initiatives on the table. Obviously they've got to cope uh, with, uh, with the Poles who are very reliant on, on, coal, uh, on coal for their nuclear power. Polish, uh, Poland I'm talking about. Um, and there's also a lot of initiatives around uh, circular economy, et cetera, which I think Japan is signing up for. And also, um, I think uh, President von der Leyen has said that, you know, they will try and enshrine some of these targets in law, and some European countries are doing that. I think we have to wait and see if, uh, again, back to what Daniel was saying about the politics, whether Sugo, you know, Prime Minister Sugo will, will actually enshrine some of these goals in, in law. Um, and there are a lot of initiatives as well in Europe around transportation, et cetera. So, so maybe I'd like to, to, to leave it there and uh, you know, hand it back to you, Ulrike, um, for any questions or further observations. Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, audience, if you would like to uh, ask a question, uh, you can type it into the Q&A and then I will relay it to our, to our guests. Um, and uh, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, I will not, I will, I will use your first name only so you don't have to worry about uh, privacy. 
uh, so, so let, me, let me just step back for just a moment. So we have this, this uh, dilemma, right? So on the one hand, we need juice. Uh, and, um, and, and, and we want it cheaply. And I want it to come out of my plug in the wall, you know, my, my outlet, you know, at all times and uh, without any big complications. And on the other hand, we have global warming. And that is, of course, a dilemma, right? The dilemma is that we, we thought of nuclear as actually being pretty good for global warming, except when it explodes, then that's not so good for anything. So, so, so different countries think about this differently, different people think about it differently. I mean, the German case is actually very interesting because there has been no issue un until that day, which was uh, March, 11th 2011 mm -hmm. there, there had been in the post-war germany there had not been a single policy issue where germans were so united uh because 65 percent of germans wanted to get out of nuclear on that day basically right and that's why um the, the government that did that pretty pretty much single-handedly and they just said okay so people are telling us that you know the majority of people are telling us that they don't want nuclear so we're getting out of nuclear but one country alone, of course, getting out of nuclear doesn't doesn't actually change an, an awful lot. That that's one problem, right? So what are what are the global coordinations? And then the other thing is, okay, so now we're out of nuclear. So let's stick with Germany for a moment. Sixty five percent of German energy is now coal, which is not good for global warming at all. But it's cheap and it's reliable, and we know how to do it, and we have the planes, right? And so. If we want to make the world a better place, we want to decarbonize it, and we want to do this in a way that does not threaten the availability or the pricing of power. So, how how do we how do countries square the circle, and how can this actually be done? So, Daniel, you mentioned your op-ed piece with with Philip. Maybe if you start there and you lay out what the Japanese government solution is to this to this challenge. Yeah, I mean, several things. Actually, I think you raised a few issues I want to go back to just a little bit. You know, one you asked about, in a sense, you know, Germany moving by itself. And actually, we've written a paper on this, and we, we looked at this question of what happened around the world to energy policy, especially nuclear energy policy after Fukushima. What we found was the following. More authoritarian countries, so China, Russia, Turkey, didn't, didn't budge at all. There was no change whatsoever. And you could look at all kinds of measures of that, right? Policy changes, changes in the number of nuclear power plants operating, maintenance shutdowns. Those more authoritarian countries didn't have the audience costs, as we call them in political science, from the democratic countries. In contrast, many democratic countries, you mentioned Germany, but of course, by the way, at the same time, Italy, for example, Sweden, a number of other countries, at least had a short-term pause Right, if not a longer term referendum on what was going to happen. Um, you also didn't mention the, the Green Party in Germany, right? which I would say honestly was probably was more important than popular opinion. Uh, the Green Party, I would say inside Merkel's cabinet, uh, had a tremendous leverage over her, uh, more than let's say the, the long lasting anti-nuclear stuff from, from Germany. So, so one thing is I think there was a, a movement, uh, we call this the Fukushima effect actually, I had a few different books on this, which means democratic countries facing broader popular backlash had to do something. Maybe they paused for a few years, um, you know, or they, or if they're more authoritarian with uh, less pressure, they did a lot less. And that, that's one thing. You ask how do we square the circle? I think it's going to be really hard. You know, a number of environmental groups uh, have remained strongly anti-nuclear. Some, like the Sierra Club, have come around to nuclear as one of the options. Uh, a number of philanthropists, like Bill Gates, for example, thinks that the modular reactor is the future of nuclear power. Um, you know, I'm a little skeptical of both sides. I think the reality is, you know, once you have a program like Japan does, uh, even if a new technology comes along, like let's say the modular reactor, which or the pebble bed or whatever else you see as the future, I think you're much less likely to see a major shift into those uh, once you have lock-in, both lo logistical lock-in, companies buying from suppliers that they know and they trust, uh, but also administrative lock-in, right? The regulators know these reactors, or they, they think they do at least, and they will stick with them. Um, you know, as you pointed out, Germany had to go back to coal, so did Japan. One of the reasons Japan's emissions have spiked since 2011 was because by shutting down, you know, roughly four fifths, or it was one time all of them, but then four, roughly four fifths now of the, of the operating nuclear power fleet, you have to fill that gap somehow. Uh, we said a few minutes ago, I think both Tom and I, that things like solar, geothermal and wind can't fill that gap, at least right now, not right now. Uh, and by the way, Paul Scalise, if he were here, would say, well, even if you filled all of Japan with solar panels and wind turbines up to hundred miles offshore, it probably wouldn't work right now at current levels of efficiency. 
meaning you have to fill the gap with fossil fuels. Uh, and I, th I think that's just the unfortunate reality. The, the promises of a decarbonized Japan are sitting on the back of a lot of unwritten checks. Uh, not clear to me, honestly, uh, how Japan can get there without really ramping up nuclear power again, um, well past where it is right now. So my, if you ask me for my crystal ball for the future, I would say it's very likely that the Japanese government uh, under the LDP, as it has been for so long, will continue to ramp up nuclear power as much as they're able to, uh, perhaps to 35 or 40% uh, of nuclear power, uh, as a total production for nuclear power, uh, and then do their best at, at the same time to assage customers and say, look, we're doing our best. You can choose your electricity uh, as Tom is doing now. Maybe it's a little bit cheaper. Maybe it's coming from, uh, I know there's some several citizen referenda to choose your own sources. Um, maybe it's coming from Osaka. Maybe it's coming from off, this, off the shore of Fukushima, but I think it's going to be a really hard process. Um, the other thing Japan already did, we haven't talked about so much, is reducing demand. Japan's setsuden, right, the, the, the reduction in demand for electricity, they did a great job early on, which makes it really hard for additional you know, economic uh, gains because these marginal returns now are very small, very, very challenging uh, you know, when it's whatever it is, 32 degrees centigrade in your office over the summer, uh, for example, to reduce your use of electricity any further. So I, I think honestly, um, all of these promises, whether it's North America's promise, Europe's promise, Japan's promise, um, if they're serious, nuclear power will have to be part of that broader, even if there was a Fukushima effect in those democratic countries. Let me just follow up with one quick, uh, Jacob has a uh, has that question actually, another clarification question. So the 2050 decarbonization plan of Japan includes nuclear power? Well, it, not officially the plan is pretty vague. Uh, mm -hmm. The white, the most recent white papers on energy do include nuclear power. There is no mention whatsoever of decreasing them. There's also no mention of new plants either. So it's kind of that, that, that uh, hedging the bet. Well, somehow, even though our aging fleet, I think we just mentioned this a few minutes ago, right? We had this aging fleet of reactors. Typically 40 years is the normal licensing we provide. We're not really quite sure what happens after 40 years uh, in terms of necessary times of maintenance, right? How deep you have to go for your checks. So certainly if Japan doesn't build any new ones as they seem to be claiming they're not going to, you'll need to extend the lifespan of the existing fleet. Uh, and of course, we know the longer uh, nuclear power plant operates simply by statistical probability, there's more chance of an accident because it's there longer. Um, um, as opposed to newer technologies, which like pebble bed or modular, which may be safer. We're not quite sure yet. Um, but I think, uh, th yes, that is going to be a challenging moment. Tom, any comments on this? Well, Tom? I would just like to, um, obviously, Daniel's talk there about the reliance on nuclear, um, Ulrike. I think, as we know, Japan continues to have an extremely high reliance on natural gas and oil in terms of primary energy sources, all of which are coming in on sea routes from places like Saudi Arabia, UAE, Qatar for natural gas, Australia for coal, Russia for coal and oil as well. So I think Japan has a lot of, you know, uh, an extreme amount of, of, of dependencies on transporting all of this um, uh, into Japan, which has its own significant carbon footprint. Um, so I think, you know, Japan, as Daniel says, I think Japan will be forced to maybe expedite some of the restarts of the nuclear, nuclear power stations. You know, we've also seen the situation in Myanmar over the last couple of days. Japan has been a significant investor in oil and, and natural gas there, but now we're not, we're not really sure what, what, can, what can transpire there, can transpire in that country, you know, given what's happened in the last 24 hours. The same in Russia, you know, the French are calling for sanctions against maybe Russian oil and gas as well. So, so again, Japan may be faced to make some very difficult choices there. And obviously with only three uh, nuclear reactors operating, I think that's a, that's a problem. The other thing, back to your question about what can be done, I think obviously one way to do, to address the German problem of switching a lot of coal power stations on is to introduce a carbon tax on this stuff, you know, so, you know, $100 um, a ton carbon tax around the world, and I'm sure that will be discussed in Glasgow in the coming, uh, you know, in November this year, probably the global uh, global um, policy on, on, on taxing carbon, taxing CO2 emissions. So that would be one way to address that. Well, if I could just channel some of my, uh, my German, uh, you know, folks, uh, what, what they would say is though, that if the green plan or a green growth strategy or whatever, whatever, you know, if that's not powerful in any country, then there just won't be any incentives, right? And so they go back and say, look, if, if Japan had spent all the money it has spent on this, this chart that you just had there, this closed loop mocks thing, right? If they had used all of those billions and billions of dollars uh, 
and mm. put them into renewable energies, we would not be sitting here today discussing this because the problem solved. However, this is not happening. And not only are there not enough incentives and, pun and, and penalties, but uh, but the government itself is not is just simply not doing enough. What, what's the, I mean, so, so is that, <laughs> What's the answer to that? I mean, that's a great question. I mean, if you read uh, Dick Samuel's earlier book, right, on the business of the Japanese state, uh, about again about how we often think about markets of energy and and all this stuff is sort of being divorced from politics, but it's very clear early on in the 1940s and 50s, the Japanese government decided nuclear power. Well, this is under Nakasone initially, of course, was going to be a pr huge priority, right? And then once you locked into the concept that you're going to have a closed nuclear fuel cycle, you just start pumping money into these, again, I would call them pie in the sky technologies, uh, things like fast breeder reactors, uh, things like the, the never quite working tomorrow, Roka show uh, fuel recycling plants, um, you know, all these things, which also, by the way, have much higher risks. There's a reason why France, which of course continues to have the highest output for nuclear power, stopped its super finish plant in the 1980s. Even they recognized that that technology was relatively unproven and likely to be much more dangerous than the average commercial nuclear power plant. And of course, France never had an accident on the scale either, either of Fukushima or Chernobyl, um, and still probably has broader uh, support uh, across its country than Japan, which has typically only been around one third of its production. Uh, I, I would say early on, the Japanese government decided solar, renewables, thermal, uh, you know, the onsen owners were not worth taking on. Those kind of technologies were not in their best interest. Um, there's a great book by James Jasper, right, where he argues very strongly that the kind of energy policies we see have nothing to do with cost, right? We're always talking about cost nowadays because we love talking about these economic things. It's nothing to do with cost, he says. It's all about what does the government support? In countries where there's very strong and clear support for a technology like nuclear power, like in France, then everyone supports it. Where it's a little more iffy, like you see in North America, right? Where Republicans and Democrats since the 1950s have been split. Even on the committees that regulate nuclear power, they've been split, right? Leaking documents, for example, to nuclear groups. Then you have this kind of wishy-washy public. You have what you have in North America, Okay, right, we have 110 odd plants, a few, some fewer now. Um, but again, overall production has never gotten about 20% because most Americans still feel uneasy about nuclear power. So I think here, this is a very political choice. Uh, and absolutely, the, the billions of dollars pumped into things like Manju, Rokasho. And of course, we haven't talked about the Dengen Sampo, right? Uh, the hundreds of millions of dollars the US pumped a year into these coastal communities that host nuclear power plants. So for example, a community that may only have around 8,000 people their budget could be quadrupled by bringing in a nuclear power plant, right? That's what the Dengen Sampo, these laws producing, uh, supporting electricity production in Japan have done since the 1970s, right? And that's a law, you know, so when Tom and I in, in, in Tokyo uh, pay our bills, right? There's an invisible tax on every bill that we pay. Uh, mm -hmm. That money goes into a pot for the Dengen Sampo and gets sent out to those communities. So again, all those are ways the Japanese government has supported nuclear power uh, to the exclusion of other technologies. Ulrike, could I say something? Please just do. Well, I mean, I, I would like to just mention South Korea because we often forget that market. That is uh, a nuclear power. There, there is significant reliance there on nuclear power. 30% possibly of electricity comes from nuclear power there. And they, they don't have those issues about these huge investments in Rokashio. They've also successfully built four plants in UAE recently. Um, so again, I, I think, you know, that that market is worth looking at from a comparative perspective, Japan versus versus South Korea. I don't think we need to go as far west as Germany or France, but and, and of course, Taiwan as well. We haven't talked about Taiwan, but Taiwan obviously went the same route as Germany and decided uh, to to uh, to end their reliance on nuclear power in the mid 2020s. So one one of the people in the audience just uh, pointed out that I may have over I, I may have exaggerated the German situation and if so uh, I'm sorry but I wanted to make this point right and the point is that uh, Japan probably cannot get out of nuclear and, and I guess I made it uh, sufficiently well because we had a, an onslaught of questions on uh, alternatives right because a lot of people don't like nuclear and so they want green so uh, mark wants to know what the green growth strategy is about uh that that japan uh um i guess uh, december 25th was the day that that it was announced and and bill uh has a great question he wants to know what netto is working on netto being the new energy development organization which is a part of METI. um 
And uh, I'll let you think about that. But I, uh, part of Net Netto's initiatives currently have been to support startup companies, uh, including in the energy field, of course. But but it's a great. I think Bill's question is a little bit bigger, which is okay. What is Japan doing uh, in developing alternative? We, we we know that the government is 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 pro nuclear, but but there's also some uh, there are other initiatives, right? So what's the green plan about? Yeah, Tom, I just want to jump in this one. I mean, I, I would say that for sure, right, in the same way that the North American government, for example, has supported a variety of alternatives uh, to coal, whether it's, again, uh, money for startups like modular reactors here in Cambridge and in, in Silicon Valley on the West Coast, uh, or pebble bed reactors, right? Um, the, the simple reality is for many consumers, right, these technologies that we're being promoted right now are relatively unlikely uh, unless there's going to be institutional support for their purchase of that. So we mentioned the feed-in tariff, which I'm sure your listeners all know already, uh, was an attempt after Fukushima as a political compromise to try and encourage consumers, uh, whether you're a small NGO or a school or a, or a homeowner, uh, to install solar panels on your roof. And that was quite successful, by the way, uh, in bringing in a number of new producers of solar power, right? Uh, but at the same time, a number of utilities were not happy uh, with, with the rules, right, having to purchase electricity from these small things. Of course, the, the, the smart grid costs more money for installation and for upkeep, and uh, a lot more energy has to go into literally keeping it up and running uh, in the sense of, of, of personnel. So that, that, ended, that ended, ended, the FIT is gone now. And I would say, you know, to really put Japan uh, in a, into a serious renewable space, more institutional support is necessary than just supporting startups. Again, you know, you can have many great technologies. Uh, Bill Gates, I think, has put $100 million into, into pebble red reactors or modular reactors. And I don't think uh, you're really seeing a strong uh, response from the market or from firms uh, supported by the national governments. So national government support here, I think, is a critical thing. Yeah, and if I could just add um, a couple of comments there, Ulrike, as well. I think we haven't talked about the numbers for solar power, but since the Fukushima accident, we, we accident, we shouldn't forget that Japan has built about 65 gigawatt of solar. So that's kind of a huge investment. I think it's number two or number three in the world. So that's been a major, I think, a significant accomplishment over the last decade. Now, looking forward, what the Japanese government, obviously, it has one of the largest EEZs and territorial waters in the world. What they're looking at is now offshore wind. I think the number I have seen is 145 gigawatt potential of offshore wind in Japan. So um, I think as they head into Glasgow in November this year, they're going to have to pull uh, what they call the NDC together, nationally determined contributions. So I think, as Daniel said, Japan's going to have to flesh out some of these numbers. And um, I think, I don't know if you, you guys saw, but I, I guess Kajiyama at Miti gave an interview to the FT yesterday, and he was again saying that Japan's absolutely committed to nuclear power. So, you know, I guess nuclear would will continue to be in there at maybe 20 to 25 percent of Japan's kind of primary energy uh, requirements. But and then there's the added issues of hydrogen. Obviously, Japan seems to be as they were heading into the Olympics, they were pushing the hydrogen as a capability. It looks like that they're investing huge amounts of time and possibly money in that. And you can switch over some of your natural gas infrastructure to hydrogen. And also there's ammonia, which is being looked at. They just brought a shipment of ammonia in from Saudi Arabia recently. So these are uh, green fuels that could be used to, uh, to, to power some of the electricity sector here. So it seems like the Japanese government is uh, pursuing both of those initiatives quite, quite aggressively. Can I jump on what Tom said? I think that those are great points. And I would add, you know, Paul Scalise wrote me about this recently, that you know, right now there's let's say roughly 300 gigawatts overall in terms of installed uh, installed facilities uh, to generate 90 gigawatts, right? So which is a roughly a third. Uh, you would need more space for solar than the mainland can provide, and even if you use floating farms offshore, as well. Uh, to get there, which, which means, you know, and that's also assuming, uh, unlike, unlike the evidence that we have from our research at the local level, that not every community is equally excited uh, about installing either wind turbines or solar. There's a lot of great research, by the way, uh, based in places like Hawaii and Japan, uh, that local movements of homeowners are quite opposed, even to what we call green facilities. Um, one of my colleagues, Shalanda Baker, has written about this in North America. People have written about this in Hawaii. There's a lot of opposition, even to things like carbon sequestration, which are, in theory, are relatively harmless, right? Even if you get it wrong, you're not really changing the, the escape itself. But there is a strong belief, and this is you could call it nimbyism as a pejorative, or you could just call it concern about the status quo. Um, but you know, a lot of these are technical approaches. Again, hydrogen facilities. Uh, how many people would really feel comfortable driving a hydrogen car uh, or having a hydrogen gas filling station near their home? 
uh, we don't really know. Uh, right now, Japan is one of the, again, once again, Galapagos kind of approaches, one of the few nations in the world pursuing um, what I honestly think is relatively unlikely to succeed a set of infrastructure. Um, hydrogen, I think, is not going to take off. Uh, in the same way that, for example, electric charging stations have already in North America. You know, I drive, I live in Boston, I drive a lot, uh, unfortunately, since the, the pandemic, and there's a lot of hydro, uh, uh, charging stations on the coast. I do not see uh, anyone installed in hydrogen uh, at a gas station anytime soon in North America. Now, there are a few experimental stations going on, of course, and Toyota is a big fan of this, Honda as well. But again, I, I'm, I'm a little concerned Japanese firms, once again, just like in the 1990s with Keitai, are taking on technologies that looked really cool and work really well locally without really thinking, okay, well, but when Apple came in, every local pro provider of Keitai was crunched, just destroyed. Um, what will happen when, when hydrogen faces a truly, let's say a, a Chinese uh, electrical car maker that's really gonna have much more efficiencies than the ones that are being created right now? So that you, you make a, um, a connection to the local level. And we have a number of questions from the audience around what it would take in terms of the government convincing people. And, and so let me, let me connect this. So Jesper wants to know why Beppu, which is this, this uh, city town in Northern Kyushu with a lot of hot springs, was actually able to build a thermal, geothermal power station when you mentioned earlier that these hot springs are often against that, right? So there's, now we're getting, not politics, we're getting local politics. I need you just mentioned NIMBYs unless you're not in my backyard. Yes, wind power is great, but I don't want wind power here, it's too noisy. And solar is great, but not on my roof. And so, so, so the, 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 this is all kind of goes to, to a set of questions we have around, what will it take for Japan's government and now I'm uh, adding a, a, a complication here to convince people that the plan is good and that nuclear power, thirty percent reliance on nuclear power is not bad, and you know, and that the localities have a voice and they can do this. But then at the same time, we see these stations, but we we see these areas where one city can do it, but there's no overall plan for it. Yeah, problem? this is one of those moments when you really have to know the local politics, right? Uh, why Beppu was able to do it? Well, probably several things. You know, one is that they got money from local and, and prefectural sources. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, I mentioned before the Dengen Sampo. These are the laws that promote electricity production at all kinds of plants, coal, nuclear power, hydrogen, um, whatever our future technologies will be. Oftentimes, local communities will say, well, if you are providing the average of around $10,000 in some cases per resident, okay, that's maybe not, not a bad risk I'll take to not be able to go to my favorite onsen. So that, that's one thing. In incentives can be one thing. But also there's local politics, right? Some communities hit by a shock. Uh, you know, maybe Beppo has more, Beppo has more connections, maybe to people who went through Fukushima and are concerned about energy independence during a shock, uh, or maybe they had a lot more people move them from Fukushima. Uh, a lot of uh, studies we're showing right now are about the networks of individuals in these communities. Uh, Tim Fraser's work is showing very strongly that the decision to install large-scale turbines or large-scale solar often depends on the networks that you have. Who do you know with the information? Who do you trust to get it from? Um, if someone that you believe in your network says, this is a good investment, even if it's risky, um, that's much more likely to be believed than some random scientist hired by whatever, uh, you know, Beppu's local government official to come in and talk to you. So I think this is one of those moments when you have to know really well, what are the local politics driving the bottom-up absorption of new policies? Right. The, uh, Ulrike, if I could just add one thing there as well, obviously we had an emergency situation here last month where, you know, a lot of the utilities were facing 100% capacity, that, and that's why the Prime Minister was asked about this at the press conference last night. So obviously one mechanism would be for the government to pass on those extremely expensive prices. We had, we now have a Japan Power Exchange here, JEPX, which saw the kilowatt hour charges going to 50 cents a kilowatt hour. In California, you pay 80, 8 cents a kilowatt hour. So another mechanism of you know for for kind of getting the public to focus on on um you know building some resilience in japan in terms of generating its own electricity rather than relying on qatari natural gas or australian natural gas would be to pass those prices on to the consumers and you know and um you know see where see see where that goes i think that would be that would be uh, another another way of, of, of dealing with that yeah you know daniel mentioned that it would be hard to save electricity in Japan any more than they do. But I think they could, people could, Japan could do much more about insulation and heating and, and making things a little bit more efficient there. But, but, but Tom, let me stay with you for a little bit here because it's, energy is not just politics or local politics, it's also a global business. Mm -hmm. It is, it is, and it's hard global business. And you mentioned earlier that all of uh, Japan's large 
uh, power companies are listed companies. They're not government owned. They are they're 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 traded on the stock market. They are under pressures to show ROE. You know, there's this whole thing about the Japanese pension and so forth saying only if your ROE is eight percent will we invest in you and so forth. So they're under tremendous market pressures to perform, right? And so. From that perspective, if you are the CEO of a Japanese power company, what is your winning strategy? Well, obviously, from 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 their perspective, you rightly point out that the ten utilities are listed, um, Ulrike, with about fifty billion market cap. It's not tremendous. It's about maybe a quarter of what Toyota's uh, market capitalization is. But you know they will be facing ESG pressures as well. So any of the utilities that are actually you know burning a lot of coal, I think that's going to be potentially problematic for these companies going forward. So this is one thing the CEOs, the boards, the independent board directors are going to have to address um, uh, is you know uh, are the CO2 emissions, and I think Japan has been kind of um, you know taking a more aggressive approach on that. They hosted two conferences last year, uh, the TCFD and the ICEF conferences where we had, you know, people like Janet Yellen speaking um, about the, the uh, ESG and the need to disclose carbon emissions. So all of these companies probably will be forced to do that. Yeah. So uh, I think that will be a priority issue for the CEOs, um, you know, the fossil fuel reliance, um, et cetera, and, and, and disclosing their exact carbon emissions. But of course, they're, they're obviously under pressure to pay dividends and pay their shareholders as well. So obviously, you know, um, pulling in generation as cheap as possible generation capacity is going to be very important for them. Um, so comparing solar to LNG to, you know, to, um, uh, to coal uh, and offshore wind now as well, geothermal if you're in Kyushu, et cetera. So I think they, they will have to look more closely at this in the months and years ahead. Let me turn this into a, a global question. So um, every government has their own plan. The Japanese government now has a plan, the decarbonization plan, a green plan, and a green strategy. Uh, Japan actually has an outlook, right? They do this very regularly. Uh, the Europeans have their own plans. I, I don't know, Tom, but uh, I'm sure you can help us understand this better. Does every country in Europe has their own plan or is it the EU and then the UK has their own thing? Um, but, but so the larger question here is, okay, so how can we get this done, right? So global warming is a global problem and it doesn't help the globe if one country gets off nuclear uh, or burns more coal, right? So the, the, somehow we have to get the world together to to do something about global warming. And that is connected to energy plants. So how, is, is there a global overarching uh, theme here? Is there is there hope that these governments can actually get together and, and, and do something that might save the world? I'm sure, I'm sure Daniel will weigh in, Ulrike, but obviously I talked about the um, the COP26 in Glasgow this coming November. So that's going to be an important forum for all countries to kind of sit around and discuss what is the next stage of uh, addressing the Paris goals. I think all of the countries, as I said, are going to have to come up with NDCs. I mean, countries like the Netherlands have enshrined their carbon emissions um, uh, goals in law. So I think that's something that uh, Japan could do or that you could have the United Nations push it, but, but also the European Union seems to be taking um, you know, a leadership role here uh, as part of their pandemic um, financial plan that they unveiled in December. A large part of that was the Green, the green New Deal, uh, which included transportation. And as I said, it tried to address issues uh, that, for example, Poland is face facing where you've got a lot of reliance on, on coal power. Um, but I'm sure Daniel probably has a, has, has a kind of broader perspective on the political aspects as well. I, I think that's completely right. And I, I would just add that I think there is sort of a policy contagion at work where a country A sees country B committing, or in this case, for example, Japan saw the European Union was pretty serious, saw the writing on the wall. Uh, you know, Biden certainly replacing Trump, I think is a broader 
uh, bellwether for where most countries are going right now. I, and again, the science is not debatable at this point. You know, we, we know despite years of disinformation from fossil fuel firms, whether it's Chevron or Exxon or Mobil, we, we know that the, the, the change is real. We know the effects are being real. We're seeing uh, climate change ref, uh, evacuees and refugees from another country is coming to Australia right now. That is actually a status, right, that exists in law. Uh, the concept that you can flee a country, like whether it's Vanuatu or elsewhere, uh, Kiribati, because it's being destroyed by choices made by other countries in the past. And I think we are going to see epistemic communities of policymakers trying to figure out what's going on. I, I, you know, Tom mentioned before the concept of $100 uh, per ton carbon tax. Carbon taxes, that's been a long debated idea. Uh, I think America is getting closer to that as well, uh, under, again, under Biden's leadership. And I think we're going to see more countries like the Netherlands uh, making these real serious enforceable things. And you know, we've had a number of agreements around the world uh, going well before Kyoto, uh, Paris Accords. And of course, the challenge as international uh, stage, as, as Hobbes would say, with, with your brutish and nasty war, uh, and a correct state of affairs, it's really hard to enforce these. Uh, and certainly Japan, by the way, uh, just pointing out something that probably everyone knows already, again, since Fukushima has not been uh, the best global citizen in terms of emissions. And again, that's because of their decision to take out of mothball a number of coal-fired LNG and oil plants to fill that gap between nuclear power and the, and the demands they have. Uh, Japan has not been on the ball either. So this is sort of, you know, maybe moving, moving one direction and then the other, post Fukushima back to fossil fuels and maybe slowly back again. But at the same time, and I'm happy to be critical of Japan, um, they, they continue to export regularly, despite recent uh, attempts to stop this, coal-fired plants to other countries nearby, uh, whether it's countries uh, in the developing world, Bangladesh, or attempts to, to sell technologies elsewhere. Japan has a market uh, for uh, fossil fuel-based uh, technologies. Uh, you know, th those firms have to be moved out of that field into something else. I think, again, that's going to be uh, both po a political decision, uh, the Japanese government, uh, you know, sort of being tired of accused, which it's true, of having different standards, right? At home, we're not allowed to build these kind of coal plants, but uh, in Bangladesh, it's okay. And I think, that, you know, there's a number of activists now pushing very hard to see e equity uh, the among the ways Japan influence technology at home and abroad. Could, could I just give you the counter argument of why this is actually a good thing? Uh, the, the, the argument that, that I hear is that Japanese coal power plants are, are top of the state of the art. They come with mechanisms and membranes and, you know, and whatever technologies that actually reduce the environmental damage as much as it can be reduced. And so given that the countries that you just mentioned will have a coal power plant anyway, it's actually better for the world if that's a, if that's a made in Japan power plant. I, I don't know what you think about that argument, but it, it, it is out there. And, right. and I, I hear it. I mean, it's kind of saying like, when did you beat your spouse last, right? Well, you know, if you're <laughs> beating them, use, use this instead. So I, I think the, the obvious argument here is something like this, right? Um, if Japan is serious about global climate change, uh, and it knows that any fossil fuel plant it sells is worse than a non-fossil fuel plant, then why isn't Japan, for example, exporting uh, free or reduced FDI in solar? Uh, you know, certainly countries that we're talking about, not equatorial, country, equatorial, equatorial countries, certainly have a market there. Uh, whether it's for solar, for example, more broadly installed. Um, you know, we know, for example, it took a shock in Puerto Rico uh, for someone like Tesla to come in, right, with solar panel and batteries post shock, because of course, Puerto Rico had been running on old North American technologies, primarily, of course, coal uh, and, and natural gas. So I, I think in some of these cases, it's true, um, you know, better the top of the line coal than a worse line coal. But, you know, why are we still talking about coal in 2021 when there are clearly other things available? Uh, another, number of these countries also, for the way, could try other things like OTEC, a lot of technologies that uh, Japan, if you're really serious about this, could be exporting instead. Well, coal is cheap, right? Tom, is that, Tom, you want to chime in on this? Oh, yeah. I would uh, I would agree with uh, Daniel on that um, um, Ulrike yes yeah yeah on the clean coal and uh, yeah if that's if, if that's the, um, the the only option available to these countries and if it's better technology than what the Chinese are doing then yes I would I would uh, say um, wouldn't stand in Japan's way in that regard. So we have a, a number of interesting comments and I thought that as a sort of a last thought I I. Uh, point out that there are many questions around dependencies, right? So why is Japan doing this if it's dependent on coal imports and it's dependent on LNG and it's dependent on why wouldn't Japan do, do other things? And then we also have uh, Nobuo weighing in saying, well, but you need to understand that um, that Japan is surrounded by countries that have, that, that nuclear is not just an energy source, it's also a weapon. That Japan is surrounded by countries that have access 
And so wouldn't it be foolish for a country in that situation to say, we're gonna go out of nuclear and uh, uh, because we wanna be a good citizen or you know that sort of thing. I mean, there's a lot of good work on this idea, right? Will Japan go nuclear? You know, Jennifer Lin has written about this. Jacques Hyman, a lot of a lot of colleagues have written about this. I think there's several pretty things are obvious. One is Japan right now, at least officially, has the non-nuclear principles guiding its actions. Uh, meaning that even if Japan, who knows, that Prime Minister Suga decided tomorrow in, a, in the midst of a bad dream to, to tell someone, okay, take the two months it would take to convert a commercial plant into something that would make weapons grade plutonium and then build a weapon and it mounted on a missile to fire, it would take a while. It, it wouldn't be overnight. It's it maybe two, two weeks to two months. Uh, most of my colleagues say it's an estimate for that time. So I think that's pretty unlikely given the broader number of restraints on the process, right? Um, so yeah, I, you know, nuclear power is not going to go away. I don't think Japan, most people that I've talked to, whether it's TEPCO or people in power, or even people in the Department of Defense, uh, are going to see it as a hedge, let's say, uh, given that we already have, and we know this now, these classified documents showing that US uh, troops regularly have in, in around Okinawa or elsewhere nuclear weapons on Japanese soil. That is to say, if there were a strike, and I think this is very unlikely, from North Korea or South or China, both I think not going to happen, but if it did, um, you know, North America would be there as part of that umbrella to use its weapons against the, the, the first striker. So yeah, I, I, I would say, um, you know, certainly it's in a bad neighborhood in some senses, but at, at the same time, think of the interdependencies among those countries, um, you know, whether it's China, for example, right now, whether it's uh, with the Korea's plural, uh, I, I don't think most people in Japan see nuclear as, as a hedge, uh, as, as a weapon on the edge there. And, and I would say, Ulrike, I mean, spending $25 billion on the Rokasho plant in Amuri, I'm not sure that addresses that defense issue or that defense vulnerability. I just think that, you know, uh, that is probably has turned into an outrageous white elephant, you know, and uh, that just never seems to stop. Uh, I think to answer Nabua's question, I think there are probably cheaper ways of doing this. I mean, Japan's defense budget is 50 billion a year. So, um, uh, you know, and they're fighting very hard for every, you know, dollar they can get, I think. So, so there are cheaper ways of addressing that problem. Well, that is, uh, uh, they're, they're, we're ending on a little bit of a sad note here, which is that we have no answers to this dilemma. Uh, I would not want to be a policymaker, nor would I want to be a politician where you're torn between the business interests and the communal interests and the politics and the local needs and so forth in the stock market. So uh, unfortunately, our time is up. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, that you joined us today. Uh, it was a terrific conversation. I have a sense we should continue this energy topic, which is actually a staple of, of, uh, of the JFIT uh, Japan Zoominar. And uh, we'll, we'll come back. We'll have uh, some people that can share uh, insights into these alternative energies and solar and so forth. So by all means, everybody, please uh, uh, check us out and see what, what else we've got cooking. Next week, it will be about whether the government can make a country more innovative. And uh, on that teaser, thank you very much, Thomas Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Aldrich, for joining me today. And everybody, uh, stay healthy, stay well, and I'll see you next week. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Simeon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good evening.